Hello, and welcome to Forget What You Learned, a place for families to stop and reflect on the modern state of education. We empower you to challenge your own thinking about today's traditional school system and ask the question, are my kids thriving? I'm Corey Greenberg, a parent in the trenches just like you, and I chat with innovators, experts, and other parents who are changing the conversation, inspiring families to reevaluate how we define academic success. This podcast is brought to you by Pacific Preparatory and Tutor Corps, sister organizations molding education through innovative one-on-one learning for students in today's digital world. In today's episode, you'll hear about an issue facing a growing number of students, educational trauma. With me on the show to address this heavy topic is renowned expert, Dr. Lisa Zaretsky, who highlights in full color the challenges faced by neurodivergent students and the limitations of the current education system. Dr. Zaretsky explains the concept of educational trauma and how it differs from general struggles in school, as well as the long lasting impact on self-esteem, behavior, and mental health. We talk about interventions that can actually change the brain and build resilience in all children while helping parents with warning signs to look for and action steps to take. Although it's not a light listen, it's one you might not want to miss. Hello, and welcome to the show. Today, we are covering a bit of a heavy topic because I think it's really important to understand, especially as the conversation continues about the overlap between our kids' mental health and our modern education system. I have with me today an expert in the overlap between the two, as well as the specific topic we'll be discussing today, educational trauma. What is it? What isn't it? What are parents and schools doing to make it worse? And what should we all be doing to both prevent and properly address it? Dr. Lisa Zaretsky has worked in the education and mental health sectors for almost 40 years and has been driven to find ways to marry the two worlds in order to help not only her own children, but as many other children and as and adults as she can. She's a seasoned psychotherapist, hypnotherapist, coach, and educational learning consultant with an expertise in giftedness, twice exceptionality, and neurodiversity. Dr. Zaretsky is a published author with peer-reviewed articles, book contributions, and a distinguished presenter at national and and international conferences. In working with neurodiverse children and adults, Lisa finds that many have not been able to achieve their potential because of the often unhealed trauma of their experiences, mostly related to not being identified, understood, or supported properly. This in turn often impacts learning to regulate emotions, develop healthy coping skills, and become the calm, self-regulated, and integrated people they have the right and the potential to be. If not addressed, these issues carry over into adulthood, often influencing self-esteem, confidence, relationships, mental health, career, and just overall life function. Oof. (laughs) Lisa, first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I want to start with two things. One, we are going to talk about neurodiversity and educational trauma because these kids are especially susceptible to it. But in a more general sense for all kids, when they're struggling big time in school and parents don't know what to do and schools sometimes make it worse. So that's one. Yeah. Number two, I want our listeners to hear your personal story because I think that it's extremely relatable and it will leave everyone with a better understanding of this issue and just what to do. So let's start there, actually. How and why did you become an expert in neurodiversity? (laughs) Well, um, I started off at the University of Wisconsin in Madison um, as a special education major, and I wanted to um, double major in special ed and elementary ed. And you have to take a class to be able, I mean, you have to take a test to be able to get into the elementary ed program. So um, I didn't do well on that and I didn't get in. And Mm -hmm. when I was a sophomore in, um, at at that school, we were, I was in a class that was learning about learning disabilities and 
all different kinds. And the teacher was starting to talk about dyslexia and I was sitting next to a really good friend of mine and she's talking and I'm always that good girl sitting in the, in the class. I always really worked hard and regulated my emotions and behaved in the schools. And I burst out, oh my God, I am not stupid. I have dyslexia. And my friend next to me said to me, Lisa, do you really think if you were stupid that you would be sitting here at the University of Wisconsin at Madison? And it was the first time that it really occurred to me that something else could have been going on, that I had been internalizing mm. this, this inaccurate message all these years because I wasn't performing commiserate with my intelligence level and what I knew and that I struggled, but yet... I was friendly from the get-go with the people who didn't have struggles in school and were in the top reading groups. And I was in the lowest reading group from day one. And then I had to work myself up and I presented as smart. So that was, that was clue number one. And then I have the gift of having three uh, twice exceptional children, also with learning disabilities and ADHD. And that was a journey in and of itself. And in my professional career, I've worked mostly with neurodivergent children before that was even a word. So the trajectory of my life and my career really just led me there without my even trying. And let's back up just one quick second, because we talked about twice exceptionality last season of the podcast, but we haven't really touched on it yet. So just as a refresher, can you just tell our audience, what does it mean to be 2E or twice exceptional? Sure. So twice exceptionality is an umbrella term, and it really uh, takes into consideration if you think of uh, a bell curve, right? And you think of the bell curve and you think of the people on the outliers. It's people who have one or more exceptional gifts, and it could be intellectual, it could be academic, it can be art, music, athletics, the list goes on. And they have a type of neurodivergence or disability or challenge that's really a, on the other end of that spectrum. Um, and it could be ADHD, learning disabilities, autism spectrum disorder. It could be a mental health issue. And again, the list goes on there too. And there's this huge asynchrony between the two. And when there's this huge asynchrony, if you think about the way the brain works, it works in synchrony with each other through developmental trajectories. And when there's that huge asynchrony, things get thrown off and, and bridges aren't built unless you make the bridges. And these kids really tend to suffer. And one of three things happens as time goes on. They either present as the gifts mask the disabilities or the disabilities mask the gifts or mm. the gifts and the disabilities mask each other. And these kids look average. And oftentimes those are the kids that fall through the cracks significantly. And that creates a lot of issues in the developmental trajectory also in social, social, emotional health, mental health, um, academic health, and they have a lot of educational trauma, which is what we're talking about today. Okay. You just said so many things that I need to unpack here. So let me, the last, the last category you said, the ones who fall through the cracks the most are the ones who look average on the surface yeah. because the gifts and the challenges sort of balance one another out. Yes. Okay. Does that show in test scores, like a standardized test score? Does it show more in just how the kid is presenting? Like It can be both. And, and okay. truth be told, be, the reason they fall through the cracks the most is because neither is being addressed. So their disabilities mm -hmm. are not being addressed and, and, and supported or remediated or intervened with, and their gifts are not being nurtured and developed, mm. um, pieces of that, putting it into talent development. So neither are being addressed. It's very difficult, any of those scenarios, but when neither is being addressed, and truth be told also, either one can be a, an issue also when somebody's disabilities are being addressed and they're, they're gifted and they're not being recognized for that or supported for that, that can lead to feeling broken and, and inaccurate messages there. Or if their gifts are only being addressed and they're looked at as high achievers and gifted and they're not looking at the struggle where they're working till three o'clock in the morning to get their work done and they're, and they're, and they're missing out on life and they're stressed and they become perfectionistic. That becomes a whole nother set of issues for those children. So all of them are really challenging. 
Do you, do you feel like our, our school system as it stands today is set up? I mean, I, you always hear about the deficit model, right? Like we, we focus on the special ed department, the like naming the disabilities and remediating that. Does it, does it seem like we're more geared to supporting those and ignoring the gifts or? Well, that's a loaded question and, and I'll answer it in this way. Um, people think most people that I run into that really don't know the educational system, they think that it, if you have something going on, that it's easy to get the support in school. And that's just not the case. There's, there's a lot of steps to go through, first of all. Um, And not everyone who's struggling is identified. If you think about how many kids are failing in, in high school and the parents are being notified and blamed versus, you know, Hey, what can we do for this kid? And, how can we support them? And maybe we should evaluate them and go about it in that way. And, and not just in high school, in all of the you know grades. And um, once something is found, um, it doesn't mean that they're going to get services because it depends on how the school views the disability. And oftentimes the rules are to standard deviations below, and you have to show that at some consistent level to get the services. So it's not as easy as it seems, even if the child is struggling and even if they present with an issue. And also school districts are not allowed to diagnose. And so they're Mm -hmm. looking at scores that have to do with deviations and how many below or how many above versus um, what's really going on. And they do not do a neuropsych. Sometimes they'll refer out or you can ask for what's called an individualized educational evaluation, an IEE once the school district has done their own testing, but they do a standard um, psychological evaluation achievement testing, and they don't look to see exactly what's going on. They're looking for actually what's the standard deviations below. And then in terms of gifted, a lot of schools do not have gifted programs. And there's most states, if not all, do not have laws in place to protect gifted children. And therefore the schools are not obligated to support or serve them. And those are usually, if there is a program, are the first on the chopping block. Oh, my goodness. Um, My other question, too, is, you know, is there a parallel here between, you know, I I really understand what you're saying about these kids that have pretty complex profiles. It's asynchronous, meaning they could be very gifted in math, but they are dyslexic and they're really struggling, you know, with English. I understand that piece. For a neurotypical kid... Can't the same be said in a way that our schools are sort of set up? There's not um, the ability to kind of take on the nuance of every human brain and kind of, you know, work with the student's gifts. I mean, that's a conversation I think that we've had a lot about the standardized test model and that, you know, everybody's kind of marching to the, everyone's, you know, in the middle. And so there isn't that ability to kind of go with the student's passion or strength at the same time as remediating just an area that they're not really strong in. Yeah. Well, I think there's a couple of things I would say to that. Um, I think that when you're looking at a school system in an industrialized manner and it's just uh, what you're going to be producing out, then sure, it's going to be really hard. But if you're looking at a school system with children that are whole children, that are a whole people and, and have all these different parts of them, then I think that it is more doable and you can weave things through the Mm -hmm. curriculum. Just like literacy is done across the curriculum, why couldn't you do universal design in ways to meet the children across curriculum? It's very easy to do. It's how you design the curriculum and the approaches and the methods you use. If you use a strength-based, talent-focused, interest-driven approach and you did individualized learning plans for each child in a classroom within the scope of the curriculum, that can be doable. You're, you're teaching the same curriculum, but you're still differentiating within the classroom. And that's what teachers do all the time. Anyway, I think it's just a paradigm. Um, I've worked in schools where even we had the eighth, the last period is enrichment. We, there was a a school district that I worked in for two years where the gifted teacher pushed for this and all the teachers had to participate. And we all did clusters based on Renzulli's model and the kids would sign up and, and what they were interested in. And every teacher, you know, offered an enrichment 
class and the last period of the day, all of the kids did it. And it was phenomenal. And it really, really boosted self-esteem. It produced its school morale. So I think that you know, there's so many different ways that I have so many things going through my head on how to address that. I really do yeah. think it's possible. And there's also the whole idea of universal design, just like anybody can get up into a school building with a ramp and an elevator. Um, and they have the right and the access to do that. We now have assistive technology and other methods to make curriculum accessible in ways that can be, um, suitable and tap potential for all. So you're saying it's, it's out there. I mean, the, the ways in which we can support all learners to differentiate is out there. It it's just a matter of implementation from the top. I think it's a couple of things. I think it's implementation. I also think it's school culture. I think it's paradigm. I think it's, um, staff training. Um, and sadly, in a lot of the undergraduate and graduate schools, these kinds of things are not emphasized or even taught. So a lot of teachers come out not really knowing about twice exceptionality. They're not well-versed in neurodiversity. If they're not special ed majors, um, there's so many pieces to that as well that, that are part of the issue. Yeah. And, and sort of connecting it to the topic of trauma. So let's, let's talk about that piece. So these kids that are twice exceptional, that are neurodivergent, that are having school experiences where they're feeling extremely discouraged, like it, th basically their needs are not being met in school. And it, it comes out socially as well, because I know that's an aspect, bullying and that. So we need to unpack that piece. But can you tell us what is, what's really the definition of educational trauma? How is it different from a kid's just struggling in school? So trauma across the board is based on how somebody internalizes an event that shapes their feelings and their, which then affects their functioning. And when, when it's internalized in a certain way and it starts to loop and it starts to affect their self-efficacy, their self-esteem, um, it affects their functioning. So um, anyone who internal, uh, internalizes an event in a certain way that is traumatic, it becomes a trauma. And many of these kids don't know what's, so when, if you don't know what's going on, like why am I not performing based on what I'm capable of and I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm trying and then they are misunderstood as lazy or dumb or the teacher writes all these red marks across their paper after they've tried so hard or they're kept in during recess. It's inevitable that they're going to internalize something's wrong with me or I'm not good enough. And that's the beginning of a problem within itself. And then that fractures their self-efficacy and their self-esteem. And then that just keeps getting fueled. And those belief systems continue to loop and they continue to experience school or academics in that way. Or same thing with bullying. If there's bullying on the playground because there's a difference or maybe even not because there's a difference. Um, and it's not addressed right away at the, on a global level. They're also going to look at themselves as I'm different. I don't belong. I don't fit in. And those internalized messages um, start to loop because they're experiencing these things over and over again, and they can only process it in the way of their chronological age. So, so if they only have the tools to be able to internalize and interpret in the way that it seems and is presented to them, and they're not getting assistance from mental health professionals or other adults or parents that don't know what's going on, to help them internalize it accurately and create the proper belief systems, they're going to have those inaccurate belief systems that then loop to in, you know, damaging patterns of thought. And that could then impact their behavior and actions. They'll internalize. That's where you see the anxiety, the depression. That's where you see uh, the kids who don't participate. They tend to isolate. Um, they, they get, they become perfectionistic. They want to perform. And if it's wrong, then there's something wrong with them again, or they're afraid to try and, and because they'll get it wrong. 
and they know that they know it or they don't know what's in their way to get there or they just can't understand what's being said but or what's being taught but yet they know that they can um mm. so those are the kids that external and the kids that uh, that internalize, I mean, and the kids that externalize, sometimes it's a bubbling over of the internalizing. Mm -hmm. So those kids initially start internalizing and then it bubbles over to externalizing. And those are the behaviors that are overt that you see that are kicking, hitting, eloping, self-harm, you know, they'll scratch, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll harm themselves um, or even others, they'll throw things and some of those kids start from externalizing right away because their limbic system is so overwhelmed and they don't have any coping mechanisms in place to be able to regulate themselves. And a lot of the times also kids with sensory, sensory processing difficulties, that in and of itself can create issues if that's not understood because they're having difficulty interpreting the entire environment. And so therefore it's not a safe environment to begin with. It's not safe neurologically, physically, or psychologically. Um, and then if these kids who are having other issues in school that are going under the radar also have sensory issues, that's like a perfect storm. And then you see more and more issues and they could be resistant to learning. It can lead to school phobia. It could lead to a whole host of, of challenges. Yes, my goodness. And it, from what you're describing, it sounds like, you know, parents should be well aware of this. I mean, these are things that they, they should be seeing. But actually, I think it can go under the radar, like you said, for quite a long time. Oh, yeah. Is that right? Oh, yes. Sometimes it goes under the radar through through adulthood. I, I did a program for ADA, Attention Deficit Disorder Association, uh, a couple of years ago for twice exceptional adults. Uh, it was a whole program, a psychoeducational program to bring into ADA. They, they, they know everything about ADHD and they present and they share with their population, but not twice exceptional. So we did a speaker series and I brought in experts on different areas of neurodivergence or different issues. And we also did psychoeducation about gifted and about twice exceptionality. And there were adults on the lot like that would come to the speaker series. I moderated a speaker series that would in the Q&A that were overwhelmed with, oh my God, this is me. And the grief that they had mm. of all this lost time and this relief, oh, now I know. And wow, there's a rhyme behind the reason for what I do. And so I think it, it and we had 70 and 80 year olds even. So I think at any age, and that was just an example to show that at any age, you know, it can go under the radar and then there's different reactions when people find out. A lot of people are relieved. Oh, okay, this is why. But then there are those who feel that that makes them feel more different or more broken. And um, that can be a whole host of issues within itself. I had a, a young boy who's uh, nine who thought his brain was broken because he had ADHD and learning challenges. And then we started talking about all the people that he knows that also have that. And one of his favorite mm -hmm. authors um, of Captain Underpants has it. Mm -hmm. And we, Dave yeah, yeah. And we started really talking about all of this. And all of a sudden, something shifted. And he started to see, wow, I have superpowers. I'm really creative. I'm really, and then we started to talk about, well, yeah, that, that's part of your brain too. And this is what shines. And this is what we're going to work on. And his whole, his whole demeanor started to shift. And if the schools, could do that kind of psychoeducation from the very beginning that we're all different, right? We talk about, you know, diversity and inclusion. We talk about that all the time. Well, what if we talked about diversity in terms of, you know, people's brains and how they learn? What a difference that would make in terms of educational trauma. Absolutely. And ADHD specifically, and I'm speaking anecdotally as a parent here, it seems to me that every one of my child's friends has ADHD. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that dismissively. I don't mean it like, oh my gosh, it's being overdiagnosed. Yeah. I I see it. And, you know, because I sort of know what to look for, especially in the inattentive mm -hmm. range mm -hmm. of ADHD, mm -hmm. like I, I, I'm a coach, like I coach my kids basketball and I've had kids where I'm like, that kid <laughs> has inattentive ADHD. Yeah. You can just, 
And, but I do feel like the schools are starting to understand it at least a little bit better, but that, that one does seem like it's, it can fly under the radar a bit because they may not be a behavior problem, but they did not catch 80% of what the teacher just said. Oh, absolutely. I was just on the phone (laughs) with a parent yesterday and, uh, he was talking about his son is lazy and this is immature. And as I was listening to all these different things, I, I said to them, have you ever explored or looked into the fact that perhaps he has ADHD? And they said, no, he's not hyperactive. He doesn't bounce off the walls. Mm-hmm. And I started to explain what inattentive ADHD looks like and what some of the diagnostic, you know, diagnostics say in terms of um, diagnostic, diagnosing somebody with it. And then all of a sudden he sat back and was like, huh. And then said, you know what? I really need to speak to my wife about this. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll come back and speak to you about it. Cause it didn't even occur. People don't know. It was no fault yeah. of his, no fault of anyone's. If, if people, people do the best they can with what they know at that time. And so if you don't know, you can't do right. And so, well, and I, and it, it's almost like mirroring your experience and the ones you talked about at the conference. It could be that that parent also has inattentive ADHD because of course it runs in families, right? And yes. <laughs> they have always coped. They've, you know, you know, yeah, they've always just coped with it. And, you know, that, that intersection of high intelligence and ADHD also seems to be very prevalent. Yes. Like, would you say that a, a large portion of people with ADHD also are highly intelligent? Yes. Or yes. Okay. I, I wouldn't say all because I have met people mm-hmm. with ADHD who I wouldn't consider twice exceptional. And, you know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of different factors that go into assessing and, and figuring if out if someone's twice exceptional. Um, but I would say there's a very large um, percentage of people with ADHD that probably fall into the twice exceptional category because they are of extremely high intelligence. Yes. And, the, and, and yes. their creativity, a uh-huh. lot of times their creativity and their innovation is, is off the charts and, and exceptional. And, and that would also categorize them, you know, in that gifted range, because if you are, it's not just, you know, it, it's the, it's the things that aren't obvious also that can be gifts. And I think people miss that too. Um, Mm -hmm. You could have super, super advanced interpersonal skills or observational skills. That is an area of gifted. And those are the kids, especially girls with ADHD, by the way, I know a few that can read a room like no one else. And then there are the girls who can have difficulty and they're social and they're, and yet they don't understand why they do what they do or why they struggle in school or, you know, they're, they're, they're not able to pay attention um, so you can have those kinds of super amazing gifts. You can be, like I said, creative and innovative. Those are, unfortunately, these kinds of strengths and gifts are not really typically counted in testing or evaluated or assessed. So I always look for these things. And I, when I'm working with, with kids and families, I'm always assessing for these things. I have specific questions that I've developed that I ask to prompt, to figure it out because there's so much information. And when I'm reading reports and neuropsychs and I'm analyzing them and going through them with a fine tooth comb, I look for those things. I look for them in the report cards, in the anecdotals. I want to see this whole child. So when I am evaluating a child, I take all the documentations, all, all of the testing, all the qualitative data as well, anything I can. And I take it all apart, like, like puzzle pieces on a table, millions of puzzle pieces. And then I look for patterns and I look for all these anecdotals and then I put it back like a mural of the whole child. And then we really can get to see, and most of the time that it's not diagnosed. So then we have to either go for further evaluation or figure out how to go forward because you really want to target specific areas of challenge and you want to be able to prioritize so that you're not overwhelming the child or the family. And you also really want to be able to nurture the strengths, the gifts. If there's any specific talents, you want to keep that going and developing it um, and, fi- and, and put in interventions for that too. So it's really looking at the whole child and having this dual differentiation that's really important. And so often, like you said, back to what we're circling back to the beginning, is that certain strengths and gifts are really missed. And those are the ones to really build on, especially if they're not academic and they're in school. How do we find ways to build upon those strengths? Like I said, interpersonal skills, for example, or creativity or innovation. 
in the school setting. There's so many ways, which requires creativity. There's so many ways. That is really blowing my mind right now, Lisa. I never, I mean, I've read a lot and talked to a lot of people. We have a lot of twice exceptional kids at Pacific Prep because they come to us because they cannot find the right school yeah. for them. Yeah. And, but I, I have never heard it described as that interpersonal gift. And I, now I can think of many people who struggle with ADHD, but have that, yeah. that particular gift that had never occurred to me. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. That is really, that is really fascinating. Um, so then I think the last sort of piece that I want us to talk about is what are schools doing wrong? Well, maybe we've already <laughs> talked about what they're doing wrong. What, what can parents and schools do better yeah. when we realize that a kid is actually being traumatized? Like if things have risen to that level of, oh no, like this absolute, this train has to slow down. We have to do something to correct it. What do we need to do? Oh, well, first of all, collaboration, in my opinion, is key. But a lot of the times that's very challenging also. Um, more often than not, the parents pick up on it first versus the school. And that becomes more challenging because then the parents can be looked at as helicopter parents or they might not know how to navigate the school. They don't know the school culture. They're starting to get very concerned about their children, rightfully so. They want to get their children help. They rely on the school. They pay taxes if it's a public school. And they think that the school is going to help them. And when they're not getting, and the kid continues to spiral and they're not getting the response that they are looking for, that can create trauma in itself. And yeah. um, and the school's reaction to that can also create um, trauma. And very often schools do react. They don't respond to that. And parents are judged and labeled and criticized. And then that really impacts any kind of collaboration. If the school finds it first, it's how you present it to the parents. So if the parents already knew, they're grateful. How can we work together? If the parents didn't know, it can go one of two ways. Thank you, you know, uh, okay, now what? Or they can be in denial. I've been in both situations on both sides of the table. Um, and if the parent is in denial, and I don't want to even say denial because that's actually a labeling too. You have to meet every parent where they're at. And parents also know their children best. And they come to the table with their own stuff and their own for lack of another word, baggage, but also knowledge. And there are things that they know about their children that the schools really do need to listen to and they don't um, because the mm -hmm. schools often think they know better. Um, and then there are times where parents, it would benefit them to hear what the school has to say um, based on the school's experience so everyone can work together. And it's, it's a challenging situation because everyone's coming from their own system, so to speak, right? You're coming yeah. from the family system and that's an intergenerational system. And then you're coming from the school system and that's a whole animal within itself, right? It's a whole culture. And, and then there's all different levels within that. And it's trying to find a middle ground. So often if there's just one person in the school that can really connect with the parents, that can be magic and that can really move things along. If there's not, and, and there's not one person that understands the parent or the parent feels safe with, that can be another challenge. And then there's also parents often go outside of the school system to get help for their children because the school either is not helping or not capable of helping or doesn't have the resources. And that really taps parents too, especially those who don't have the resources. It could really yep. drain parents uh, emotionally, financially. And yet many parents say, what am I supposed to do? You know, so I'll, I'll do what I have to do. And then there are those that I say, I, I just can't. And then they're in this cycle of all of these traumatic things going on. The kid is internalizing and externalizing, and that creates trauma for the parents. And then the parents don't feel enough because they can't provide for the child, whether it be resources, interventions, financially, it becomes cyclical and it can snowball. Yes. And the two words that keep coming to mind as you're talking is school refusal. Because I think that's at the point, right, where the kid has just reached their max mm -hmm. and they just shut down mm -hmm. and they just physically cannot go anymore. And then, like you said, the school is like, your kid has to show up, yes. you know, and the parents like, I, you know, there's, there's just a lot 
kind of unpacking um, that piece. And, and, and it's a crisis at that point. It, yes, it's, it was probably a crisis before then. And it just mm -hmm. either was not recognized, was not addressed properly on either end or collaboratively, um, or they just couldn't find a solution in time for when it, hap when it happened. Usually from my experiences, um, there, the issue is, is the school and the parents are, um, are not having the proper communication and, and the school is, has certain expectations and the parents have certain expectations. And I'm not saying anybody's right or wrong. However, if everybody sticks to their guns, then we can't come together. Right. Um, and a lot of times in those scenarios, I feel it's very important for the schools to hear the parents. They're seeing what's going on when their kid gets off the bus and they're dealing with their kid getting on the bus. If that kid is not wanting to go to school in the morning and not putting on their clothes and kicking and screaming on the way to the bus or school, there's a crisis already. There's a problem already. And you can probably, there are those kids that don't want to go to school in the morning and you can't get them out of bed and you know it's difficult to get them dressed and you're late to work and you're late to getting them to school. That can be perpetual through their whole school career. That's still a crisis because there's still an internal crisis going on. And those are the kids that wind up with anxiety and depression and um, challenges with school. And maybe that'll impact their academic performance even more so because of the emotional um, piece. And very often, any kind of trauma can create brain fog. So if you're already struggling in school and then you have brain fog on top of that, then you're going to struggle even more and you're going to not know why. And so that creates a whole nother set of symptoms. And the parents, this is all going on internally. They only see the outside. They have no idea what's going on inside. And a lot of mental health professionals, unfortunately, really are not well versed in this either and can create even more issues if they're not well versed. Um, and poor advice, like forcing a child in certain situations can be very detrimental, but yet that's the norm. Your child has to go to school. The school says your child has to go to school rather than building bridges. And many parents are in a situation where they have to go to work. So what do you do? And then that's right. traumatizing for them also. Right. There are these right. perfect storms that seem that happen all over the place and, 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 and they're, you know, happening everywhere. And, and a lot of times I think in, in our society, we're not recognizing that. And we're so quick to, to judge and label parents um, for just trying their best. And um, that creates their, the, another whole set of, of, of challenges when the parents are feeling like, you know, and they're, they're just trying their best and doesn't work or what works one day doesn't work the next day, which is very common with two kids. Mm. And they're just on this proverbial treadmill and they feel it and they just feel like they, they, a learned helplessness can come into play. A despair can come into play. If you don't feel like you have a partner on the other side in the school or you, or there, or you feel that there's animosity or anything of the sort, that can make it 10 times worse. And more often than not, that's the case. So hoping to move to a hopeful note, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I told our listeners this was heavy and, and it is heavy because I relate to every single thing you're saying. We've seen it at Pacific Prep sure. with some of our students. Yeah. I have seen it in my own life. Um, and it, it does just feel like a train that doesn't stop moving. And, and so the parent is in the role of having to really recognize when it's gotten to a point action has to be taken. It's not about like, you know, pushing your kid out the door in the morning right. and saying, you're going to be fine. Right. right. If they're, if they are telling you every single day for a while that they don't want to go to school, that is a red flag. Absolutely. And yeah. And it even starts before then, Corey, it even starts mm -hmm. with resistance for homework. It starts mm. with, um, I don't want to do the homework, the resistance. And a lot of parents think it's, it's, it's you know, they're tired or they're being obstinate or, um, usually when there's a pattern of that, there's a challenge and there's something going on and that needs to be paid attention to. And many parents just, you know, either force their kids to do it because they don't know any better 
or yeah. they will just go with it and the kids don't do it. And then the kids get even more traumatized in school because then they didn't do the homework. And then the parents get scolded because they didn't have or force the child to do this, the, the homework. So it's like yeah. a lose lose type situation. And then you have the kids that start throwing the books and the workbooks and they start breaking the pencils or they'll start, you know, I had a kid who, who's uh, one of the kids I work with started to like uh, put paper clips in his mouth and, you know, threaten self-harm out of anxiety and frustration at the school. And what did the school do? They asked him to leave because they did not feel equipped, understandably so, with a child who, you know, was threatening self-harm. And, yeah. and when we know these things and we're really looking at them for what they are, and if everyone's working together as a team, a whole multidisciplinary team, the whole child team, could you imagine, and I see this when it works, how when everyone's working together and we're really looking at that mural that I tell you about that I kind of, I, I often do in my practice and I put together and we start intervening in all the areas and we start plant, doing what I call a whole child plan and everyone's working together and first we triage, right? And you implement things at the systemic level as well, you know, and the child is a system in and of self. So where do you start? You start implementing things that the child needs in that system, but that system interacts with every other system, the family system, the school system, the community system. And if you put things in place that really will help the whole, you know, the internal system, all the gears oiled and working synchronistically, and then you do the same for the approaches with the school system and the family system. And if everything is slowly being put into place, then everything can sort of, you know, picture it all as gears. Everything can start working systematically. But if you have something that's broken or fractured and it, how can the whole piece work? But I've seen that when all of those things are put into place and there's a whole team approach and the parents are included, miracles happen and the children change and the right interventions are put in and, and everyone's on the same page. Sometimes extended family can sabotage, sometimes other personnel or providers can sabotage, but if it could all be reined in again and everyone's on the same page, you know, the way I work with children in those crisis situations, first we triage, right? We yeah. need to build on success. So we need to figure out like where the, like I told you that the whole piece is where we look where the challenges are, where the strengths are. Let's grab those strengths. Let's find how we're going to triage and build success. Let's start building on success. And this is, you know, classic strength-based, talent-focused, interest-driven. How are we going to find that in a psychologically safe environment? And what are we going to bring in to do that? Even if it's in the home, right? Even if we're, if the mm -hmm. kid is on, is on homeschool instruction or whatever it may be, even if it's after school, even if it's on the weekend, start with one thing that's successful, build in the next thing that's successful. Even if it's a provider that's successful, that can have safe reciprocal rapport and is working and can stay there like a language provider or a learning specialist that's success. And then you, another program, say it's enrichment, that's success, whether it's online or in person, the kids who have behavioral issues usually have to start online, but it could be either way. And that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the triage. Then you start building the ground floor and you, you start building that foundation and you build a team to really support this child in all areas that they need the support, nurturing all of their strengths, nurturing all their gifts, finding ways for them to feel successful, to be successful, to experience success. And then you slowly bring in ways to, to navigate and support the challenges to build those bridges so that it's being addressed through a strength-based, interest-driven, talent-focused approach. And then as those bridges are built, you can then start growing there too. And I see it time and time again, when, when that can be put into place, again, miracles happen. And with the right interventions, the kids' brains start eventually changing too. The limbic system calms down. The whole nervous system starts to integrate. And obviously part of the interventions is, you know, therapeutic interventions too. Um, even a simple FM for a kid who has an auditory processing disorder within nine months to a year, the neuroplasticity of the brain already starts to change the wiring in the brain and their brain is changing to be able to hear, to, to be able to process intonations and sarcasm and things like that, which makes a huge difference 
in their ability to learn, in their ability to interact socially, in their ability to use language. The FM still is helpful as an intervention, so it's an accommodation, but it also does more than that. So little by little, you bring in the things, and I also work with the multidisciplinary professionals, and I'll ask their expertise, like if you have to choose one, two, three, four, five of all these recommendations, what's your top priority, right? Usually yeah. I'll know, but I want their advice, and we build this multidisciplinary team, and, and the, the fire gets gets put out. Yeah. And you're really just building their resilience and ability to cope with adversity and advocate for themselves once they're in, like you said, that psychologically safe place and they've built upon all those strengths that they now have. So yes, that's actually well, the, part yeah. of the plan. Like I call that, that that's, that's innate in the whole child plan. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And every, every discipline has that goal too. You know, so if it's the language therapist, mm -hmm. if it's the school, if it's, if it's the literacy specialist, if it's a learning specialist, if it's an OT, it, whatever it is, that I think that's the goal for all disciplines coming together for that child. Well, thank you for that because now I feel like we're in a more hopeful place. <laughs> and the the key is to, is to make it a team approach, like you said. And, you know, obviously the parents are the, the biggest advocates for their children and um, really kind of have to go to war sometimes, but it's necessary to just get all those pieces together. So. It is. And I would say also meet the parents where they're at. You know, every parent is going mm -hmm. through their own thing and you don't know what's going on behind closed doors. And so often that could be sabotaged too. And, you know, you want the parent to be like, oh, if you, you just have to meet the parent where they're at and just little by little go with where they're at also. Yeah. Cause there could be shame. I mean, the, you know, the parent could feel a lot of shame about whatever it is, like feeling like they let this go on for too long or maybe how they have reacted and, you know, not recognizing it for what it was. So yeah, it could be yeah, that, or they that. could be totally overwhelmed and they can only do one mm -hmm. thing at a time. And there's no yeah. shame in that either. They're doing the best that they can and they're still doing yeah. something. Yes, absolutely. We're always doing the best we can. That, I think that's universal of every single parent. Whether, you know, it's what the kid needed at that particular moment or not, we're all human and really doing the best we can. I agree. And so. I think that the best piece that, that people can remember from that um, is that that very quote that you just said, parents and, and even children are doing the very best that they can at that moment in time. So even if a kid mm -hmm. is acting out, it could be helpful for a parent to remember this, my child is doing the very best that they can with what they have and know mm -hmm. right now. And in reflection, you know, you know, kids can look back at their parents and say they did the best they can with what they have. And as a professional, I really encourage all professionals, especially if I hear, you know, judgment on the parents, really saying just meet them where they're at. They're doing the very best that they can. Hold compassionate yeah. space. Yeah. Okay. Well, as I suspected, we could go <laughs> on and on and on about this topic and others, but I will have us stop at this moment and ask you to recommend uh, one or two, a couple of books that you think that our listeners should read. Sure. When you asked me to, for a book recommendation, I couldn't narrow it down to one. So <laughs> that's fair. So um, I have three. Um, my first favorite is um, it's called Lives of Passion, School of Hope, and it's by Dr. Rick. Posner, P-O-S-N-E-R. And it's a story of a bunch of uh, families in Colorado in the 70s. And it was in the public system at the time that uh, were not happy with the way their children were being educated and they were struggling. And it talks about how they, with the public school, which is very rare, I don't even know if it could be done now, um, built their own school um, within the community um, based on the Sudbury model. And it, it's the premise of the free schools. And um, it, it really uh, talks about the, the name of the title is How One Public School Ignites a Lifelong Love of Learning. And I, I read this and it was so inspiring because it shows that, that anything can happen and anything is possible in educating our children and our children learning. And it goes on to talk about the trajectory of these people, even in their adulthood and how they all went on to find careers and passions and build families and are successful. And it really talks about how the respect of each child and family is a big piece of that puzzle. And we were talking earlier about how do you do that, you know, in this big system? Well, they found a way. 
You know, they found a way through children's passions, interests, strengths, talents, and then you, the rest comes. So that's one of my favorite books. Okay. I love that. It's going on my nightstand. Yeah, I love it. It's still, it's still one of my favorite books. Um, and that's available on Amazon. I checked. And then uh, another one that I really love is The Power of Neurodiversity by Ta Dr. Thomas Armstrong. And I actually did a book review on that. And if people go to my website, they can find the link to that book review in 2E News at Bridges. And um, this is really talking about the spectrum of brain functioning. And it does talk about very specific areas of neurodiversity, like ADHD and autism and certain mental health conditions. But it really talks about the strengths of them and showing that all brains can be different and we're all wired differently and we all have our strengths. And when we optimize on them, magic happens. And we all can really optimize on that and what that does. I think he does a phenomenal job and it's really inspiring too. Um, and then the last one um, I think is really helpful for all parents, but particularly those of special ed parents who are just either starting to figure out that there's something going on or they already know and they're trying to navigate the system. Um, it, it's called New Directions in Special Education by Thomas Eyre, H-E-H-I-R, and uh, really talks about ableism in a lot of ways. And sometimes it's important to really understand what's going on with labels. Labels are controversial, but when you can identify what's going on and label it just for the label to, as a means to an end, that can really help you in terms of advocacy, getting what you need, the supports, the interventions. It's not a definition and it doesn't, it's not an identity. It, it is yeah. a means to an end um, and you don't even have to connect with it if you don't want to, right? So you can, it, it's just a means to an end to get the help and support that you need. And also talking about not boxing kids in and how we need to be able to, once we understand these kids within the system, give them every opportunity possible. And it, in a way it's a strength-based book, but it's more about navigating the system, recognizing ableism, recognizing means to an end and how to really help these kids in the most positive ways. I thought it was an excellent book as well. And I think it could be very helpful for parents in the system now. Lovely. Thank you so much. So we will put all of those in the show notes with the Amazon links so people can find it. Um, okay. So lastly, how can people find you, Lisa, if they want to um, work with you individually or just see, you know, the, all the various events that you're going to speak at and your publications and everything, how can people find you? Oh, thanks. So uh, they can go to my website, www.drlisazaretsky.com, D-R-L-I-S-A-Z-A-R-E-T-S-K-Y. They can email me at info at drlisazaretsky.com, I-N-F-O-D-R-L-I-S-A-Z-A-R-E-T-S-K-Y. And they can go to my social media pages. I'm on Instagram at Dr. Lisa Zaretsky. I'm on Facebook, same thing. I'm on TikTok and I'm on YouTube. Oh, you're on TikTok. I'm not even on TikTok, but I might make an exception to see what you're posting over oh, there. Oh, well, actually my TikTok was, uh, <laughs> had, it was, it had, it had to come down for a minute. We had to fix it. Oh. And, um, uh, because it takes 30 days for you to be reuse, reuse your name, it's going to be going back up on April 15th. So it's temporarily okay. down, but check it out after April 15th, it's going back up. Um, Great. in the meantime, you can check me out on YouTube, Instagram, uh, Facebook. Oh, and on All LinkedIn, things. of course. Yes. Perfect. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. Like I said, I, I think it was a really necessary one and other topics this season are going to both build on and come back to this um, in various ways. So just really appreciate you. Thank you for coming on the show today and take care. Thank you. I'm so happy to have been here. It's such a privilege. Thank you for having me. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forget What You Learned, hosted by me, Corey Greenberg. As always, our goal is to allow you to zoom out on the snapshot of your family's life and answer the question, are my kids thriving? We're here to inspire you to make those small and maybe big changes to answer yes. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Pacific Preparatory and Tutor Corps sister organizations committed to educating students with an innovative and holistic approach in today's digital world. 
Don't forget to subscribe to the show and leave a rating and review. See you next time.